Hey all, we're going to be discussing opioids next as part of this course in clinical toxicology. This presentation corresponds roughly with Goldfrank's chapter 36. The learning objectives today are that after you've read the chapter, watched this video, and studied any other supporting materials, you should be able to differentiate between the terms opium, opiate, and opioid, explain the chemical structural relationship between morphine, codeine, and heroin, and be able to identify at least four opioids that have some unique differences, atypical mechanisms or clinical effects that distinguish them from the usual suspects. We're not going to be focusing here on opioid addiction or societal impacts of the opioid crisis, and we're hardly even going to mention opioid pharmacology. These are all very worthy topics, possibly warranting lectures of their own, but they are not immediately relevant to the bedside care of individual poison patients, which is what I'm choosing to focus on recognizing the signs and symptoms of overdose, and identifying those opioids with special features and unusual presentations. We'll start off by defining and differentiating opium, opiate, and opioid. The opium poppy is the natural source of opiate alkaloids. Opium comes through Latin from the Greek opion, meaning a poppy or poppy juice. The scientific name for the opium poppy, Papaver somniferum, therefore literally means the plant with juice that induces sleep. And here's that juice. Opium is the dried exudate, or latex, produced when the seed pods are cut into. After the poppy flower is pollinated, the petals will drop off and this bulbous seed pod develops. The farmer will then go through the field slicing the seed pods and will come back later to collect the latex after it's had time to dry. This seed pod exudate contains morphine and codeine with smaller amounts of several other opiate alkaloids. And if you've ever wondered why morphine is called morphine, that's what this slide is all about. In the very early 1800s, the German pharmacist Friedrich Serturner isolated the active component of opium, and he named it after Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams. In his initial writing, Serturner said that he'd isolated the Principium Somniferum, the principle that caused him and his associates to fall asleep when they tested it. And he called this substance morphium, since Latin was the global language of medicine at the time. The Latin morphium then morphed into morphine, as we call it today. Getting back to opium cultivation for a moment, here we see several seed pods with dried latex on them. This opium is harvested by scraping it off the seed pods with a curved metal spatula, and now you've got raw opium. Opiates are the naturally occurring chemicals derived from the opium we just collected. By far, the most predominant opiate is morphine, comprising about 10% of opium's dry weight. The next largest amount is codeine, at around 2.5%, and the others are minor contributors. Opioids are those agents that produce opiate-like effects and or bind to opioid receptors. Opioids come in a few types. Since we have opioid receptors in our bodies, it makes sense that we'd have some endogenous substance that would bind to them. Otherwise, why would such receptors develop and be retained through evolution? There are semi-synthetic opioids. These share the core chemical structure seen in the opiate analgesics and are typically made by chemically modifying opiate alkaloids, some examples being oxycodone and heroin. And there are also synthetic opioids, which are structurally different from morphine, but bind to opioid receptors and have similar effects such as fentanyl, meperidine, and methadone. We've already seen that many opioid drugs share a common five-ringed chemical structure as seen in morphine. If the hydroxyl group on carbon-3 is replaced with a methoxy group, then you've got codeine. And if the hydroxyl groups on carbons 3 and 6 are acetylated, you've got heroin. We're going to keep our discussion of opioid pharmacology really basic. Opioids bind to opioid receptors, and the mu receptors are the most important of these. There are also delta and kappa receptors, which are much less important clinically, and lots of details about signaling mechanisms that we're not covering here. For practical purposes, it's sufficient to know that opioids bind to receptors, most importantly to mu receptors, resulting in their therapeutic or toxic effects depending on the dose, and these effects can be blocked or reversed with competitive antagonist drugs like naloxone. Opioid agonism has effects on several organ systems, the most notable of which are effects on the nervous system, the eye, and on respiration. And exposures to too much opioids should result in an opioid toxidrome. The classic opioid toxidrome produces a triad of signs. CNS depression, respiratory depression, which is a subset of CNS depression at the respiratory center in the brainstem, and meiosis, small pupils. 
Okay, that's the typical stuff, but what about special cases and unique effects? This is going to be a real potpourri of miscellaneous facts. We've seen that codeine is structurally very similar to morphine. Codeine itself is a very poor analgesic. Codeine requires metabolic activation into morphine, which occurs by cytochrome P450-2D6, and this enzyme has notably variable expression. If a patient is deficient in 2D6, occurring for example in 5-7% to of Caucasians, codeine will be ineffective. Other patients can be extensive 2D6 metabolizers, such that what should be a normal codeine dose is converted into a toxic dose of morphine. Heroin is diacetylmorphine, so it has acetyl groups covering up the more polar hydroxyl groups in morphine. Heroin is therefore less polar and crosses the blood-brain barrier more readily than morphine, which may help explain its greater abuse potential. Heroin is then deacetylated into morphine in a stepwise fashion, and the morphine continues to have CNS effects. Toxicologic testing might be done to determine why a patient had a positive drug screen for opioids. Was it because of therapeutic drugs they were given, or was it due to suspected heroin use? It's very difficult to detect heroin because it has a short half-life. And if you detected morphine, well, that could be from morphine or codeine or heroin exposure. But if you found monoacetyl morphine, that's going to be a metabolite of heroin. The human body doesn't add acetyl groups to morphine, it only removes them from heroin. It's also important to recognize that street heroin almost always contains adulterants or contaminants. The only thing on this slide that I'm going to emphasize is that some of what's being sold currently as heroin contains, or is actually completely substituted, by fentanyl. Since fentanyl is more potent, and the amounts aren't tightly controlled anyway, this puts the heroin user at risk for misjudging the dose, which can result in fatal outcomes. Methadone is a long-acting opioid used to treat chronic pain and for opioid substitution therapy. The graph in the upper left depicts how an opioid-dependent person might feel. Heroin has a very short half-life, so the user is frequently dipping down toward withdrawal and feels compelled to take another dose. But with methadone's longer half-life, those swings are slurred out, such that once daily dosing can prevent withdrawal and the urge to use non-scheduled opioids. In addition to mu opioid agonism, methadone is also an NMDA receptor antagonist, which is helpful for chronic pain management. Methadone also prolongs the QT interval and may provoke arrhythmias. Here we see an EKG from a methadone patient with torsade de pointe, and this might explain an uptick in risk of sudden death seen in patients recently started on methadone. Tramadol has both opioid and non-opioid mechanisms that contribute towards analgesia, but it can also contribute towards seizures, especially in overdose, and development of serotonin syndrome. Tramadol has a bad reputation among toxicologists because it's not a reliable analgesic and carries other risks, especially in overdose. One toxicologist I know has written that tramadol is what would happen if codeine and Prozac had a baby, and that baby grew up into a sullen, unpredictable teenager. Loperamide is an OTC antidiarrheal drug, and the reason that it's available over the counter is that at normal doses it's very poorly absorbed and doesn't have any CNS effects. It only slows down the GI tract. But people have figured out that at high doses, enough loperamide can be absorbed that it does enter the CNS so it can be used off-label to prevent opioid withdrawal or even as a euphoriant. However, these high doses result in cardiotoxicity. The upper EKG here shows evidence of loperamide-induced sodium channel blockade, and the lower EKG shows loperamide-induced potassium efflux blockade, prolonging the QT interval and producing torsade de pointe, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Dextromethorphan is a common over-the-counter antitussive that has a chemical structure that looks like an opioid analgesic, but it doesn't have analgesic effects. Dextromethorphan shares some properties with other opioids, such as cough suppression and the potential in overdose, to produce an opioid toxidrome that can even be reversed with naloxone. But it has differences from typical opioids also, such as NMDA receptor blockade, which can induce some PCP-like psychomimetic effects, and it's proserotonergic and can be involved in serotonin syndrome. Dextromethorphan's psychomimetic effects and the fact that it's available over the counter contribute to its popularity for recreational misuse. Robitussin DM has dextromethorphan, and if you drink enough, you can go robo tripping. Coracidin Cough and Cold, nicknamed Triple C, is a multi symptom cold medicine intended for patients with hypertension since it doesn't contain any sympathomimetics. But each pill contains 30 milligrams dextromethorphan hydrobromide in a much smaller, more easily ingestible volume than a liquid cough medicine. 
Meperidine, or Demerol, is a nearly obsolete opioid that used to be much more popular. But years of patients asking for Demerol by name ultimately led to it falling into disfavor, and it also has some atypical clinical effects for an opioid. Unlike most other opioids, meperidine causes medriasis, large pupils, rather than meiosis. This is due to meperidine's anti-muscarinic effects. Part of meperidine's chemical structure actually closely resembles atropine. Meperidine is also converted into a neurotoxic metabolite. High doses, especially in patients with renal insufficiency, can lead to agitation or seizures. And in case you run across it, if you see a reference to an opioid called pethidine, that's what they call meperidine in the UK and some other countries. If opioid-dependent patients stop or sufficiently reduce their intake, they can experience withdrawal. Opioid withdrawal is very unpleasant, which makes opioids hard to quit because redosing is an easy way to fix it. But barring some other complication, opioid withdrawal should not be life-threatening. I've listed here the expected signs and symptoms, which you can read through at your leisure. Or maybe you'll like this graphic mnemonic flashcard better. There is one thing on this card that probably needs some extra explanation, and it's that baby crawling on the ceiling. This is supposed to represent a famous scene from the 1996 movie Train Spotting, in which Ewan McGregor's character locks himself in a room to detox from heroin and hallucinates a baby on the ceiling. Hallucinations are not a regular feature of opioid withdrawal. But I can recommend the movie, and there's other scenes related to opioid use, overdose, and withdrawal that I think are good illustrations. And that's all I have for you about opioids. I'll be seeing you around.